A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering under the radar cases and headline making cases from around the country every week. We are recording this on May 6, 2020. I am Anna Garcia. As you can see, we are still following the safer at home protocols and we are recording this from my kitchen. Joining us today is former prosecutor Lonnie Coombs, also who is safe in her beautiful home today. Hi, Lonnie. How are you? I'm so good, Anna. It's nice to see you again, as always. Oh, it's always lovely to see you. This is my moment of the week where I have some virtual human contact. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. You start to feel like a human again when you're, you know, putting your clothes on, your makeup on and actually talking to someone. So it's nice. Yes, I say it's the one day of the week where I shower and do my hair and put on some makeup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm about down to once a week, too. <gasps> yeah, exactly. But it's a lot less laundry. <laughs> it is. It is. Right? And honestly, my face, I think, is loving the no makeup, you know, and there's some benefits. Totally, totally. Well, we've got two incredible cases, one that is really unbelievable. Like if you made this one up, no one would believe it. We're going to look at these two cases today. A romance novelist in Oregon allegedly killed her husband for his $1.5 million life insurance policy, but it's the story behind the story that's fascinating. And four women have been arrested after they allegedly killed a mother in Arizona. The mom was seen screaming for help before she was killed. But first, here's a word from one of our sponsors, Raycon. Hi everyone, who doesn't love the highest quality earbuds possible for listening to music or their favorite podcasts? We here at True Crime Daily, the podcast, certainly rely on the best audio possible. And that's why we're really excited about these Raycon earbuds. These are the everyday E25 earbuds. And they're pretty amazing with what they do. The earbuds come in this little carrying case, and it's pretty amazing that on a single charge of the case, they can actually charge your earbuds four times on that single charge. These earbuds are Raycon's latest and best. They come with six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and more compact design that gives you a nice noise isolating fit, and it also comes in a bunch of different colors. Raycon earbuds started about half the price of some of the premium wireless earbuds on the market, and they sound just as amazing as some of those top brands. Celebrities like Snoop Dogg and Brandy are also obsessed with Raycon. If you want to get a pair of Raycon earbuds, we have a special for you. You can get 15% off of your order. Just click on the link in the description box below, or you can go to buyraycon.com slash TCD, that's for True Crime Daily, for 15% off of your order. Once again, you can go to buyraycon.com slash TCD for 15% off your order. We hope you enjoy. So Lonnie, our first case is really unbelievable. It's like out of a bad murder mystery book. A woman who writes murder novels is herself accused of murdering her husband. In real life, this murder she wrote story is about a wife who so far has not gotten away with murder, but we'll see. This is the case of 69-year-old Nancy Crampton Brophy of Oregon, and she is charged with killing her chef husband, 63-year-old Daniel Brophy, for $1.5 million in insurance money, which, what a surprise, she was the sole beneficiary. And the murder happened in 2018, and she has been in jail so far awaiting trial. So we're going to go with, with the latest news right now, which is she asked for a bail hearing. Now, is that weird, Lonnie, that, um, you know, she's been sitting there for two years waiting for trial and she's still trying to get out on bail? Well, no, this is actually very, it's a very timely issue. She's asking to get out because of the COVID-19 she said, look, um, I'm vulnerable because of my age. And so I want bail to get out so I can stay in a, a cottage or somewhere, and, you know, while this is pending. So I don't get the illness. Now, a lot of people have been doing that. And a lot of celebrity uh, defendants who are in custody have been trying this, like Harvey Weinstein and, and Bill Cosby. Um, 
And so she did the same thing. She had her attorney go in and say, look, because of her age, uh, she's vulnerable. And so we want bail set at an amount where she can actually get out and wait outside of the prison system while this coronavirus goes by and while she's awaiting trial. It's interesting, she, they, because she did that, all of this information is now coming out about the case because before that, the prosecutors sealed everything up. They had sealed up the arrest warrant affidavit where essentially they lay everything out, all of the details and all of the evidence they have. And that's how we find out usually about what evidence the prosecutor has before the trial. But they'd had that sealed up. They hadn't said a word to the media really over all this time. But because she brought this bail hearing because of the coronavirus, the prosecutors responded by saying, OK, we're going to have a motion in court. And we're going to lay out all this evidence for the judge to show you that we have a very strong case and she should not be let out. And that's how all of a sudden we know all of these really juicy details about the prosecution case. And the details are very juicy. And we should let everyone know that the judge said, hell no, you're staying in jail. Go back to your cell. <laughs> yes. Yes. And that all happened last week on uh, April 29th. OK, so let's dig into the case of this romance novelist who used a minivan as the getaway car. It's just, it's the too much. The details, seriously. I mean, you know, this romance novelist, this this chef. I mean, it's like literally this was a book that was written, right? For entertainment, yeah. but not. Ex exactly. The, the sad thing is she wasn't that good of a writer. <laughs> Had right. she actually written this, she may have been more successful and they True. could have avoided this whole mess. Yeah. All right, so Nancy is a self-published writer of romance crime novels with titles like The Wrong Husband, Hell on the Heart, and my favorite essay that she wrote, How to Murder Your Husband. Foreshadowing. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, I find that interesting. If you are in the subject matter of writing about crime, like I always wonder when I'm Googling something or doing research for one of my crimes, I think to myself, dear God, if somehow I were ever implicated in a crime, what will my Google history tell That's me? That's right. They'll look at the search history and go, oh my goodness, she was planning this all along, right? I know. I know. I think the <laughs> and, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that actually will, will come to bear a little later uh, in the case as we unravel all all of this. So Nancy has described herself as saying this is why she loves writing. She says, my stories are about pretty men and strong women, about families that don't always work, you know, and about the joy of finding love and the difficulty of making it stay. Mm, I have a little insight into her. Okay. Well, the books apparently were not very well written. They didn't do very well. And she had to actually pay because she was self-financing the books to get them published. And that apparently, you know, ultimately impacts their financial stability because, you know, they're paying a lot of money for her books. So the other job she did on the side, she sold insurance policies. Of course she did. <laughs> of course she did. <laughs> of course she did. So the crime books are not making a lot of money. It's draining their finances. And of course she's selling her life insurance policies. Um, and the thing is, she was very, very sloppy. If she is indeed guilty of this, she was unbelievably sloppy with the evidence. Let's talk a little bit about the characters here and her husband and their marriage, and then we'll get into the juicy details. So she's accused of killing her husband, Dan Brophy, who was a culinary instructor at the Oregon Culinary Institute. The murder took place in one of those kitchen classrooms at the Institute on June 2nd of 2018. She and Dan had been married for 27 years. Dan was a chef and head instructor at the Institute where he had worked for more than a decade. His students loved him because he was kind of like a goofy guy who liked to dress up in costumes. And he loved food, obviously, and he was a mushroom expert. So we have a little clip from YouTube that we found where Dan is talking about his passion of food. And I think it just gives us a little insight into his character. I would say in the last 35 years, I've had about 150 vegetable gardens. Yeah, this is just this is the life. Working on a uh, spice contingency, so students can purchase spices at wholesale rates, but in small enough quantity that they'd be useful in the home kitchen. Because I feel if people work with more ingredients, they have a fuller understanding of what to do with them. So I'm always looking to learn new ingredients, uh, new techniques, new cuisines, 
And that keeps it interesting for me. Dan is described by his friends and his students as a super nice guy who was really generous, always helping the homeless as well. They lived in Portland in a big house that apparently was big enough so they have chickens in the yard. And he had a big garden, which of course he would use for his cooking. Um, Dan often told friends that Nancy was the love of his life. And she too would write about that. Oh, well, at least that's that's what he told him. All right. I so, mean, far- honestly, so far, it sounds like a romance novel. I mean, it sounds like this idyllic situation and everybody seemed to love this guy. You know, he would do funny things like if they forgot to um, wash their hands, his students, if they forgot to wash their hands and make them wear oven mitts. I mean, he had these really fun, funny ways to teach them. And he was also a marine biologist. I mean, he has had all of these interesting you know, um, passions in life, and he just seemed to live life to the fullest. They also said that um, every Thanksgiving they would do a big bake off, and then all the pies he would actually go and personally deliver them to the homeless. So he just had a wonderful character about him that drew people to him, that made them love him. And, um, you know, I kind of wish I could have met him because I love yeah. mushrooms too. So, I mean, it just like he sounds like a really fun, interesting guy to know. I was thinking the same thing as I was reading up on him and looking at his videos. I thought, gosh, I would love to live next door to this guy. Yeah. yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. That would be like your perfect neighbor. Mm -hmm. Although, of course, it turned out to be, you know, the woman he was married to was like your worst neighbor. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So, so far, I think you're right. This thing is sounding like a fairy tale, a romance Mm -hmm. novel. Everything is perfect. The characters are perfect. All right. So what could possibly be the motive for killing this lovely chef Dan. Okay. Apparently in the year before he was murdered, Nancy and Dan were having some terrible financial troubles. And all of that has come to light now um, with prosecutors revealing what was going on. So how bad do you think it was, Lonnie? Well, you know, apparently she had told friends that she wanted to sell the house and go travel. That was her dream. And that she was afraid that she wouldn't be able to get her husband to go along with that. And apparently they had this home Um, but she, and it was valued around $350,000 it had actually been in his name, but in 2017, this is the year before he dies. Um, he put it in both their names. Interesting move. Another interesting move is that she starts buying all of these insurance policies, a number of different ones on him where she's the sole beneficiary. And so all together, they add up to quite a bit of money. And during 2017, she's paying the premiums on the insurance policy, up to $16,000 worth of money on premiums, but she falls behind in the mortgage payments on the house, which was just $6,000. So you can see where her uh, priorities lie. It's in the insurance um, rather than the house itself. So she's doing some interesting things with the finances during this year prior to when he dies, which once again shows that she's plotting and planning all along the, the way here. So do you believe at this point she has set up the plot to kill him, that that's what she's moving toward? Yes. And there's another interesting thing, too, in this. She specialized in life insurance and workers' comp claims. And what's interesting is part of their life insurance and workers' comp, if he died at his location where he worked, then she got more money. Oh, my God. (laughs) Yes. So yes, I do think this is all being plotted and planned together. So, you know, besides the fact that she also wrote at one point about, you know, talking about killing her husband. Remember you talked about that. And if you want to murder your husband and then she says something like, but I don't want to worry about blood and stuff on the walls of my house, like having to clean it up. So another reason to off your husband at his place of work, you don't have to clean up the mess, right? I mean, there you go. These are all different things that she kind of talked about and she's just solving all of these little issues as she goes along. So, yeah. Oh my God, that's unbelievable. The house is interesting though, because since the house was in his name, had sh- had he died and the house was still in his name, then the house would have been part of the estate. It would not automatically have gone to her because he has an adult son from a previous relationship. That's right. That's exactly right. Who is now also trying to, you know, claim some money here and suing her for wrongful death of her, her, his father. Yes. Yes. He had, there's a whole other drama going on with the family and the court and the judges even ruled on that. And and so, yes, we're going to get to that as well. All right. So now we're seeing the premeditation. 
one year before his murder. And now she's got the house. She has the insurance policies, but she's not paying the mortgage. All right, let's get to the day of the murder. It was a Saturday morning because he taught on Saturday mornings. Um, when Dan taught, he also would open the school first thing in the morning. That was one of his responsibilities. So at 721 in the morning, Dan turns off the school's alarm system. At 7.30, the next teacher arrives who will be teaching that day. And at 8 a.m., the students are allowed in. When they walk into their classroom, their kitchen classroom, they see Dan on the floor. He has been shot. He's been shot twice, once in the back, once in the front. And one of the students tried to do CPR, but it, it was too late. Nancy says that she was home all morning. And that's what she tells the police. And she actually rushes over to the school. Someone calls her, tells her something's happened. It's not the police who reach her, it's someone else. And she shows up at the school as the distraught, um, well, new widow. I, I wanna go back through the timeline because what ended up happening is that the police searched all the security cameras in the area because there was something very suspicious about his murder. He still had his wallet his cell phone, his keys, his car was parked outside. There was no sign of forced entry and there was no sign of a struggle. So clearly it's like an execution, right? Mm -hmm. Very suspicious. Right, right. And it doesn't seem like it's just someone random coming upon someone taking advantage of trying to do a robbery, right? It's someone who's targeting him specifically. And perhaps right. he knew because he's, you know, either he was shot in the back or he knew who they were and wasn't surprised by them. Exactly. So that's why police were very suspicious here. And we know we always look at, at the, the spouses or the significant other. So once they gathered the video from around the school, this gives us a very interesting different timeline because what we see is Nancy's minivan several times driving by the school. Now we can't prove that Nancy was driving the minivan, right? But it is her minivan, okay? Chances are it is Nancy. That's what I'm gonna say. So let's look at the new timeline. Nancy's minivan is seen in the area starting at 6.39 a.m. So it looks like she got there early to scope things out. At 7.08, Nancy's minivan is seen outside of the school before Dan goes in. I even, I even made a very sad, sad little chart. I love this. <laughs> Because I want to ask you something very specifically about this timeline. Okay, 708, Nancy's minivan is seen in the area. 721, mm -hmm. Dan disarms the school. Mm -hmm. Next thing is at 728, we see Nancy's minivan again. And at eight o'clock, the school opens and he's found dead. So that's, is it possible that Dan is dead? He's killed in just seven minutes? Is it? possible in just seven minutes because i took a look at her she doesn't look like a really nimble lady <laughs> that is just such a lovely way to put that <laughs> um you know when you're when you're shooting with a gun you can do you can do it very quickly and she probably wanted to do it very quickly because she knew she had a small window there before students started coming in right and so she she could have been waiting because we know she was there earlier than when he turned off the alarm she could have been waiting literally just outside around the corner as soon as he turned off the alarm she goes in you know shoots him and then she's gone because we know she's taking off very quickly it's also interesting that the school itself did not have any surveillance cameras which she might have known and thought oh i'm safe i can do this there's not going to be any video but you know nowadays if you're aware everybody has video you know the streets and stuff security cameras and so they were able to get other um security uh surveillance video but as far as the school itself there were no cameras i found that really interesting which made me wonder is it possible that dan isn't the one who disarm the school that maybe she did she probably would have known the code clearly she knew there were not cameras inside so mm -hmm. she and she would have known that because she was married to dan do you think she had help oh interesting i'm just I'm, wondering i mean we haven't heard any details about that um like maybe she had a, a lover or a boyfriend or someone you know um, I mean, the prosecution seems to have done a lot of work on this case. I would think if there was somebody else involved, they might have arrested them. But I don't know. That's that's definitely a, a plot twist that I would keep my eyes open for. Again, I when I saw those, those seven minutes, I thought, mm, could this woman pull it off? And I, yes, you're right. It is enough time, especially if she's in place, goes in, kills him. You know, it's interesting. Yeah. She shot him in the back and in the front. 
So yeah. I wonder what happened there. I mean, I, you kind of assume that she shot him in the back first, right? She came up from behind him um, to surprise him. And then when he went down, she came up for the close-up execution shot, which is very cold, you know, right there in the chest. And then just took off just to make sure, make sure he's dead and then take off. Which means she really hated Dan, really hated him, right? Which is strange. Either that or she's just so egotistical and it's almost like he just became a character in this murder mystery that she was writing in her head. You know, I mean, um, narcissists or psychopaths, I guess, can really come up to that point where they have no empathy for the other person. It's not even that they necessarily hate them. It's just kind of like, okay, you're in my way and, I, and, I'm, and so I'm going to get rid of you. Um, I don't know. I just because I, for me, it seems like he seems to be such a hard person to hate. But you know, after being married for all those years, you never know what's going on. Yeah, I, I feel. Yeah, he was just so likable. You know, maybe more people liked him than liked her, and that bugged her. You know, people are weird. So the next day after Dan's death. Nancy goes on Facebook and this is how she tells her friends and family that he is dead. She writes, for my Facebook friends and family, I have sad news to relate. My husband and best friend, Chef Dan Brophy, was killed yesterday morning. For those of you who are close to me and feel that this deserved a phone call, you are right, but I am struggling to make sense of everything right now. Is that bizarre? It's so strange. It's so, she's more worried about what people are thinking about her, right? Mm -hmm. Than about how horrible it is that she's, you know, just lost her partner in life. Mm -hmm. uh, her husband of 27 years. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so then the school has a candlelight vigil, hundreds attend, it's outside, she's there as well. As you can imagine, at this point, it's only, you know, a day or two into the murder, and it seems like someone random, you know, ran into the school and killed this man who everybody loves. So it's really a shocking community crime. I mean, mm -hmm. everyone is very upset. Now is when she really reveals her true self. Three days after poor Dan's death, she contacts one of the detectives and she says, hey, can you, can you get me a little letter? Can you get a letter put together that says that you've eliminated me as a suspect so I can submit that to the insurance company? Now, she should know, based on all of her research for her books, that it never happens that quickly. They never right. clear the spouse that quickly. But she, her greed overcame that. Because she needed that money. Yeah. <laughs> she had to go on her, her her world trip. Yeah. Oh, my God. Well, needless to say, the uh, cops did not give her the letter, but it kind of really sent them looking in the direction of the wife, right? Because wow. that is just way too suspicious to overlook. So that's when they find all of the insurance policies. But that's not all. Because remember, Dan was killed with a gun. So they're also searching for the murder weapon because the murder weapon was not left at the scene. So but what the was what, what was left is yes. the, the casings, which is very interesting because any experienced um, murderer or killer knows that if you're shooting a gun where there's casings shooting out, you know, flying around, you want to collect those, especially if there's only two and it's there in a small area where they probably were very easy to see. You collect those because if they're left behind, that's evidence that the police can use to try and match the murder weapon to that killing, right? These were left behind. Intentionally, because our Nancy had already come up with a way, a, you know, workaround, if you will, how to make it look that her gun did not kill her husband. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's unbelievable. So Nancy tells detectives that she and her husband bought a Glock at a gun show and they did so after the school shooting in Parkland, Florida, that that was the motivation for buying the gun. Nancy also tells the officers that she's never used it and she's never bought any ammunition for it. And that appears to be a half truth because a search of her browser history revealed that Nancy had been researching 10 ways to cover up a murder. What? She's, she's precious. <laughs> Nancy's too much. <laughs> she apparently also Googled something called ghost guns, and then she ordered a Glock gun kit and some parts from eBay. Can you explain what it is that she did? So I, I actually thought that this was pretty fascinating. She switched out parts of the gun, right? Okay, so she wanted to be ready when the police came and said, hey, look, we found these nine millimeter casings. Do you have 
you know, a, a gun. And she's like, oh, sure. Like, I can be totally forthcoming about it. I have a gun. We bought a Glock 9, nine millimeter. It was for, you know, the Parkland shootings, but I've never used it. I've never done anything with it. How many ammunition? And so they would take that gun. They would fire it. They would test the casings from the crime scene next to the test fire casing. And it, it wouldn't match, right? Because what she did is she bought these extra kits that she took out parts like the... Um, the barrel? Uh, yes, the barrel from the gun and put in an, a new part of that, use that for the actual murder, all right? So that barrel is the one that put the little um, telltale identifying marks on the casings that were left at the crime scene, went home, took that barrel out, got rid of it, and put in the original unused barrel. So that when they tried to say, is this the murder weapon? No, the barrel doesn't match the case scenes at the crime scene because she'd switched out the barrel. I actually think that's fairly creative because I've never heard of that done before. In all of the murder cases I've done, I thought, wow, you're, you're really coming up with some good detail here. Unfortunately, the fact that she'd searched for all this stuff on her computer, I'm not sure why she thought that would not come up. Um, you know, put off the red flags that, hey, she could have done this with the with the gun and that could be the murder weapon. It was just modified for the actual murder and then put back into its original pristine state. So when the when the police took it and tested it, it didn't look like it matched. Well, I think she did think um, to delete some information because she bought those gun parts, those additional gun parts, some of them on eBay. So she, a few days after she bought the gun, she deleted the eBay account. Oh, what a surprise. The cops yeah. were able to find that. Yeah. Nothing's really <laughs> deleted, people, criminals. Then nothing's really deleted on your on your computer. They can find it. <laughs> Unbelievable, right? So it was... So then there's like this three month period from the time that Dan is murdered until Nancy is finally arrested. And, you know, they're gathering this information. They're doing the search warrants on all her history. So they're gathering all these pieces. Meanwhile, she is preparing to sell the house and move. She tells her friends and neighbors she can't stay in this house anymore because it's it's memories of Dan. And she needs to move on. And probably no one at the time thought anything weird about that. But this no. was all part of the getaway. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. But ultimately, she's arrested in September and she is charged with Dan's murder. And then so many people were totally shocked. I mean, really, her friends and neighbors were like, what? This is this is crazy. You know, and they kept saying, well, you know, even if she writes these crazy novels and these um, theories and plots, it doesn't mean anything. It's just a joke. I mean, it's just her work, right? People were still in denial that yeah. this could have really happened. Yeah. And, and they're right. I mean, technically, theoretically, people can write whatever they want to write. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're out plotting and planning. But when you have all the insurance policies and all the other things in place, then you're doing more than just writing. Yeah. Now, here's something I find very weird um, that, that came up during, I think, this bail stuff. Um, prosecutors said that Nancy has been engaging in criminal behavior while in custody. Yes. What the heck is she doing? I don't know. But I thought that was fascinating. And it totally does not surprise me, right? Because this is the way she thinks. She's constantly thinking and getting herself into trouble. Um, and it's interesting because they also put in place, I think, a, like a do not bother, a restraining order, right? Did I see that somewhere? You did. You did against um, uh, for in behalf of. Uh, in the protection of Dan's family. Yeah, they yes. did. The judge has prohibited Nancy from contacting Dan's family. The court says that they are victims too. And right. Dan's son from the previous relationship is suing Nancy for wrongful death, as you mentioned. And he is also cha challenging her right to the estate, which is valued at least right now about 375. That would be for the house at least. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's going after. And so I I don't know, but I kind of think that Dan's son may have a case here. Well, absolutely. They have this, uh, I don't know if it's called a slasher law, but it's referred to it that way. And that is that killers cannot profit from killing someone. So if she's found guilty of killing Dan, then she's not going to be able to profit from his death. And so all of that property would then most likely go to the son. Does that mean, Lonnie, that the insurance policies would actually go to the son or not because they were bought with the intention of defrauding the insurance company. 
Right. I'm not sure how their policy is written up, but they are t- the house is something that would most likely transfer to the sun. And it's interesting because it's valued at like 350, but it's on the market, I think, for like 650, which is a lot more money. So oh, who knows? Right. You know what? It's the mortgage and not paying the bills. <laughs> they owe the bank a lot of money, is my guess. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> all, all the money that went into her uh, books that never went anywhere. Very strange. I, I do want to go back to this whole custody thing because mm-hmm. um, what would your insight be into this? Because they're, they're saying that they detected that she was committing crimes based on what was going on with the people visiting her. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's interesting that they actually felt the need to put in place these restraining orders, do not harass Dan's family, right? Specifically making sure that people knew that they were a victim. So I don't know if, um, you know. Oh, if they're connected, that that could be what's going on. Oh. Right. Or if she, if she had contacted them and said, come, and she's trying to persuade them she didn't do anything, or she's trying to say, look, maybe she's trying to cut a deal, you know, with the son. You can have half the money, I'll have half. I mean, she's constantly, her wheels are always turning. Um, or maybe she has friends that are coming who still believe in her, and so she's trying to get them to do things um, maybe set up other alibis or, you know, manipulate the evidence somehow, whether the friends are knowingly participating in that or they just, you know, are friends with her and like, oh, sure, that doesn't sound, you know, too bad. I'll go do that. So, uh, but remember, again, people who visit in jail, everything's recorded. Unless it's the attorney where there's the attorney client privilege. So any friends, family that come, everything's recorded. So whatever she's plotting and planning is being listened to. So, uh, you'd think she would know that as the uh, murder mystery writer. <laughs> it's funny because on the one hand, she gets into all the details of things that she, you know, is plotting. And then on the other hand, she's forgetting some big, you know, um, logical things that go on like that you're recorded when you're talking in jail. So. Amateur. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank heavens, right? I always say thank heavens because yeah. that's how murders are solved. So I know. And I honestly... Uh, While it's easy to make fun of Nancy because of her, you know, murder mysteries and just what a bad job she's done. At the end of the day, she actually did pull off murdering her husband. And and she didn't need to. I mean, why kill this lovely man who was doing so much for so many people? You know, as we always say, just get divorced. And obviously her, her mind was too much on the money. But, you know, you could have just divorced this man. Let him go on with his life and all of the wonderful things he was doing. And then you go off and do your thing. So it's it's a horrible tragedy for his family. Well, maybe she didn't want to get divorced because of, you know, something she'd written before that gives us some insight here. In 2011, she published this essay called How to Murder Your Husband. And in that she wrote, divorce is expensive. Do you really want to split your possessions? I believe Nancy did not. Oh, and this is something also horrible that she wrote. So, um, or if you're married, or if you married for money, aren't you entitled to all of it? The drawback is the police aren't stupid. They are looking at you first, so you have to be organized, ruthless, and very clever. Well, there you go. She is somebody. There you go. But it's interesting, too, with the one sentence she goes, if you married for money. Mm Mm-hmm. That's a lot of insight there, too, because she made this out to be like this wonderful romance where she found her soulmate. But if you marry for money, shouldn't you be able to get all of the money? So maybe maybe she just married him for his money out of all that because the house was in his na- name. Mm-hmm. Remember? So maybe I don't know. Maybe she was you know, more ruthless all along than we imagine. Um, it seems that her writings are really going to come back to haunt her during the trial. I don't know to what level, you know it's of any use in the prosecution. Um, What do you think? Yeah, this has happened in a number of murder cases that I'm aware of, and and they will use those writings, they'll submit them to the jury, but as far as the impact on the jury, mixed. I don't think any jury is going to convict someone of murder based solely on something that they wrote at some other period of time in their life. There's gotta be that evidence too, you know, there. Well, she did write, the thing I know about murder is that every one of us have it in him slash her when pushed far enough. Mm-hmm. And then in 2002, mm-hmm. she wrote, murder, mayhem, and gore seem to come naturally to me, which means my husband has learned to sleep with one eye open. It gives you chills, right? 
I mean, she projects herself as this romance novelist, but really she, there was this whole other side to her that seems to be much more the real her. Mm -hmm. Well, her trial is set for September. Hopefully the pandemic won't delay it because this yeah. is going to be fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So Lonnie, our second case is about four Arizona women have been arrested on suspicion of kidnapping and murdering a mother of three. 34-year-old Melissa Valenzuela was reported missing by her family on March 20th. She was found dead three days later. There's a lot we don't know about how she was killed, where right. she was found, why she was killed, but four women have been arrested and they were arrested on April 24th. These are their names, Nadine Chavez, 34, Christina Gomez, 39, Mercedes Gomez, 32, and Melissa Servin, 42. It's just weird to see four women arrested for the murder of another woman. It's, yeah. it's very unusual. All right. Yeah. This is the little bit that we do know. The victim was last seen on March 17th with these women at a Phoenix home on West Hadley Street. The home belongs to one of the women who is charged. Her name right. is Nadine Chavez. And yeah. there's so many names, I don't want to confuse everybody. So witnesses say that the victim, all right, Melissa the victim, was arguing with three women, three of the four who have been arrested. This was all taking place outside of the home. Mm -hmm. They start physically fighting, and then apparently they try to pull Melissa into the house and she screams for help. Then she yeah. screams for someone to call 911. And that's when one of them covers up her mouth and drags her into the house. And amazingly, there's at least this one witness that we know of who is watching this whole thing and nobody calls 911. And it seems pretty obvious. If you saw this going on, would you call 911? Well, yeah, if she screams, call 911, then you know it's not some, you know, weird, you know, they're just horseplay or right. do you know what I mean? Right. And then there's there's three or four of them and then they cover her mouth and drag her in as she's screaming. I mean, it was very clear something was going on there, but nobody calls, unfortunately. So. No, nobody calls. And so then there's quiet. And then the next day, the women are seen outside cleaning yeah okay so they're cleaning something up who knows what they're cleaning up apparently this one witness who is a brother of one of these women mm -hmm. of the four arrested mm -hmm. um he claims that he went into the house and there was blood in the bathroom and there was a um like a tile like a ceramic tile that was missing mm -hmm. and melissa the woman who was screaming to help for screaming for help is gone like mm -hmm. she's just disappeared Mm -hmm. Um, now this is really strange. And I wonder if this is partly how the police found them the following day. One of those women, you know, gives the brother, um, I guess, what was it? A debit card right. that belonged to the victim. Yeah. And she also had the pin number. Yeah. Yeah. So what I think is interesting here is it looks like the prosecution or not. Yeah. It looks like law enforcement has built this case on three witnesses. One, the first witness you talked about who saw from outside. So she might've been a neighbor or someone. She sees the screaming, the victim yelling for help being dragged in. And then the next morning she sees some of the women cleaning the porch. Okay. That's one witness. Then the second witness is the brother, like you said, of Nadine Chavez, who is the owner of the house, right? So he says he was there that night, which was the 17th, they, they believe that she was killed that night, right? And then he goes back the next day, and that's when he sees the blood. He sees this um, broken tile in the bathroom, and he asks his sister what happened. And she allegedly confesses to him and says, there was this woman here, two of these women brought a third woman here, they got into a fight, they killed her, and then they left, right? So he, mm -hmm. she actually tells him all of this. And then, like you said, one of the other women ends up giving the brother this debit card of the victims along with the pin. Now, why would they give it to the brother? Were they trying to buy his silence? Was Possibly. he part of it? Were they just trying to get rid of it? Um, why was the debit card even taken? And how did they find out her pin number? Unless they tortured her. Exactly. Exactly. And was so that the motive for the killing or was that just something else that happened? I, you know, men and women really do behave differently. Mm -hmm. um, like if 
if we replace these women with men, I would say it was about either a deal that went down that went sour, or it was about money, could even be about a lover. With women, it's like, okay, it's possible that it's also all of those three, but there's something, these these women got very mad. I mean, they, they, they jumped, right? That what would cause a woman to go so berserk for all of them to gang up on her? Right. I and mean, de- and the, and the ganging up is really interesting too. Yeah. And and her family, the victim's family, has said we think we know what the motive is, but we're going to wait and see what's said in trial. So there must be something that they know about that's a connection with these other women. It's not just a random thing. There must be some type of connection. For the family to think that they understand what the motive might have been to kill her. That, boy, it's really open to speculation at this point. I I know it is speculation, but do you think it's over a man? A man or money? It's one of the two. That's exactly what I think. A man or money. Yeah. A man or or both. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's true because they did take the debit card. So we know there is some money, uh, you know, in there somewhere. Otherwise, forget the debit card, right? If you're killing, if it's a rage killing over a relationship, like you slept with our man or whatever, uh-huh. why, you know, then you're going to the extra step of getting the debit card and making sure you get the PIN number before you kill them, right? So the rage wasn't all just, you know, spontaneous rage. This was something that they were still, like you said, sort of a torture aspect to it. I don't mm-hmm. know. Oh, yeah. I think so. I think she was tortured without question. Well, they... Yeah, right. what what causes the 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 broken tile, right, or the missing tile, or whatever it was? I mean, how do you do that? There's definitely some force used there for that. So the woman Melissa is finally reported missing by her family, um, and as police start going back, uh, certain things they're finding, like they are uh, they've found the location of the house because, as it turns out, when the family reported Melissa missing, her picture you know, was in the news and all of a sudden she looks a lot like the woman is screaming outside the house the other day. Ding, 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 ding. Right. So that was a tremendous help in helping authorities figure out at least where she may have been. So Melissa's body was finally found on the 23rd, but police are not saying where the body was found or how she was killed. So we know that the body was removed, or at least we think so based on one of the witnesses. Right. Which is also interesting that the police are not releasing any of that, especially since they already have those four arrested. I mean, a lot of times there's what is called a holdback, right, where police will not put all the details out there because they want, if somebody comes forward and says they know what happened, they let them lay out the story. And if they get that detail that the police haven't told in the media, then they know, hey, this guy has some personal information as opposed to they just read the, you know, read what was out there in the in the news reports. But they're holding back where the body was found, how she was killed, what condition the body was in. That's a lot of information. Um, so maybe they think there's even someone else involved. I don't know. So it's, it's interesting that all of that detail is being held back right now. Yeah, it really is. They are doing, you know, obviously they're waiting for more forensic information to come in, not only from the scene, because they did go to the house and they did find blood and that that tile, it was either broken or missing. And then they did a bunch of other forensic testing and that apparently has not come back yet. That probably will yield a lot of information about who is in the bathroom, whose blood it is, whose DNA it is. Yeah. And the other thing that's interesting too is they have not charged these women with murder yet. So they have a dead body. They have these witnesses, right? And this alleged, you know, confession to the brother, but they have not charged these women with murder yet. So they're clearly waiting for more information, more evidence to come forward. They've only charged them with kidnapping at this point. Wow. Wow. So, um, you know, these search warrants have obviously found additional supporting information. For example, their cars belonging to the women. Some of the cars they were able to identify had been on the street at that time. Um, I, it seems to me like the brother is cooperating, the one who was given the debit card yeah. and actually knows a lot. Um, the four of them are expected to uh, appear again in court. Uh, there's an interesting um, spectrum, if you will, on the bail that's been said, set. Three of them have bonds set at 50000 and one of them, Servin, her bond is at 500000 Yeah, half a million. I, I, I know. Either she has 
a prior record. So they're bringing that in to up the bail or they believe that her involvement was so much more than the other women's that they, you know, have put hers. But, but that's a significant increase on one of the women. Yeah, really. Yeah. So a lot more information to come on that. It's a very unusual case um, because of the number of alleged attackers and potential killers here. Um, we're going to keep an eye on this one. Yeah. So it is time for our comment section. A Utah trooper pulls over a five-year-old boy who was driving his parents' car on the interstate. The Utah Highway Patrol officer, Rick Morgan, said that he had been watching for speeders on I-15 near 25th Street. Because obviously now with no traffic, everybody's gunning it, right? right. That's true. I know. It's true. <laughs> I'm driving along. All of a sudden I look down, I realize I'm going 75 because there's like nobody around to keep you going. Yeah. That's I know. Cool. It is fun, though. I have to admit. I know. <laughs> okay. So then he sees this SUV that's going like crazy slow, like 35 miles an hour on a highway. And it's also weaving and it's driving so erratically. So the trooper goes to pull him over. And later the trooper says, I can't even believe that when I pulled him over, he was able to stop the car because it was a five-year-old driving the car. Oh and my so, goodness. So uh, he sees the little boy at the behind the wheel. And of course the trooper asks him, um, so what are you doing? And of course he has a great answer. He says, I'm on my way to my sister's house in California. Whoa, that's a long trip. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very long trip from Utah for a little guy, right? Mm -hmm. And um, he told another trooper that, um, you know, he was obviously trying to find his family and that additionally he would really like to buy a Lamborghini when he gets to his sister's house and he even showed the trooper that he had a wallet no driver's license but he had a wallet and he had three dollars in it oh and wow just, well he was ready to go <laughs> he didn't really cute. thought this through it's so cute I mean it's very dangerous obviously yeah. but Oh my God, kids are hilarious. <laughs> they are. They're they're crazy. But you know, he'd put this whole thing together. He got his money and he was ready to go. And the amazing thing is that he managed to leave the family house, right? Yeah. So nobody even notices that the kid is missing and right. that the car is missing, right? Right. Nobody's reported any of that, right? Nobody's called no. the police and said our car is gone, our kid's gone. No, he's still he's out there on the freeway. I mean, on the highway. That's. How did he even get on the on ramp? I mean, it's crazy. Exactly. How did he get from the house yeah. on the on the on ramp and then stayed? I mean, he was traveling for a while before he got pulled yeah. over. Yeah. I just. <laughs> how oh, could he even? An, yeah. Yeah. How could crazy. he see? Exactly. So these are the comments as you could possibly imagine here. Dolores B writes, "I want to know where to get one of those three dollar Lamborghinis." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So do I. Uh, <laughs> Patricia J. How did a five year old reach the pedals? And how did he see out of the front window? Yes. Plus, he looks older than five. You know, I there is that photo where um, he's blurred. Right. He does look very big for a five year old. I will say that he well, looks you, like a ten year old. Well, you'd have to be because honestly, you know, I have short legs, you know, and in a lot of cars, I have to move the seat up so I can see over the, you know, the, to see out the windshield. So it's amazing he was able to do the gas pedals and look out at the same time. So he must be a big kid. Yeah. And Mosa M writes, and yet I am in my late 20s and I don't know how to drive. <laughs> well, that's a good point, too. A lot of the, you know, 20 year olds aren't interested in getting their licenses or buying cars. They're just Ubering everywhere. So this is sort of an old skill that he seemed to be able to do. I'm not sure. <laughs> He's an old soul at heart. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. This next one is, uh, you know, COVID-19 related. A Texas park ranger who was trying to disperse a crowd on a sunny, beautiful Thursday at Lake Austin says that he was pushed into the water when he was trying to get people to disperse. This video was shared on social media and it appears to show that the ranger is speaking to this crowd, explaining to them, please, you need to keep six feet away. Can we please have some social distancing? And then the video shows that this guy comes running up and then pushes the cop into the water and then the guy takes off. Luckily, because of the video, they were able to get this guy, Brandon James Hicks, who's 25 years old, probably thought he was really funny, not so funny, because he's been charged with attempted assault on a public servant. What is wrong with people? You know, I, I, yeah, I know. I, I, it's interesting because I think there's, <clears throat> we're in, we're in California, right? Where and in in Los Angeles area too, where the restrictions are very tight, 
and where most people are following those restrictions. But there are people that either it hasn't been that restricted for them or they're already at the protest stage, you know, because they're fed up with it. And so you've got people now, instead of, you know, we're bringing the best out of everybody and we're showing our humanity and our love and kindness, that tempers are flaring. And unfortunately, you know, this poor park ranger ended up being the target of it. He's just, you know, he just went to work today, you know, he was told by his boss, you know, make sure you tell everybody to enforce this. And, and out, but he becomes the target of this, this rage that somebody has. Either that or it was just a joke, but. Yeah, but not so funny. And, no. and several people who were there and witnessed this said that the guy, that the ranger was being super nice and polite and cool, he, that he wasn't being a jerk about it or bossing people around. So it's not like his attitude would have provoked this. Right. Again, the guy probably thought it was hilarious. Yeah, well, mm. not so funny. Uh, these are some of the comments. Uh, Anita M writes, thought he was real smart. Hope he's taught a lesson. Think before you act the next time. Mm -hmm. Andrew G writes, he's smiling in his mug shop, but park rangers are law enforcement. I'm sure it was a felony assault. Could it be a felony, do you think? Could it rise to the level of that? Well, it depends, it depends on, on injuries, yeah. Yeah, okay. And then Carmen C writes, very sad, no respect. And that's just it. There's yeah. like no respect. It's everybody is stressed out. So why yes. add to the stress of the situation? Right. This is the, this is the part that undoes me, you yeah. know? And, and like you said, in putting on a mask, it's not like, you know, a huge intrusion. Yeah, it's a pain. Uh, it's uncomfortable, but putting, asking, you know, to put on a mask or to stay six feet away, it's not that big of a deal really in the big scope of things. So, um, especially if we're trying to get the economy going, we're trying to get people involved again and being able to come to the parks and being able to do these things. If, if you, to do that, you have to put on a mask. Well, I think that's a small sacrifice. I think so we can do it. I, well, I agree with you. I'm wearing my mask. I have masks all over the place. You know, too. they're in the car, they're in my pocket, they're in my purse, they're everywhere because they are required in California or you are not allowed to go into a store, which is what I find interesting about that case in Michigan where the security guard um, tried to enforce the wearing of a mask and it ended up deadly. This is just outrageous to me. And I hope that um, this case gets a lot of coverage. So people are put on notice that this cannot happen. That this cannot be done. Um, this woman wanted to go into a store. I think it was a dollar store mm -hmm. and the security guard is outside and he's been told to enforce, you know, tell people that they need to put a mask on. Well, that's, he, that's what that store decided to do to protect their employees, which I think is a wonderful thing. These employees are there working during these situations. And so this woman didn't want to put the mask on. I guess there was a, a verbal back and forth and he wouldn't let her go in the store without a mask. So she left and came back with some family members. One of them pulled out a gun and shot and killed this man over a mask. And I just think that is a horrible thing to do. And yet we all need to be aware of this and to be put on notice and to make sure that we're doing what we can, that people don't get to that level and that there's a huge deterrent that people know this is not going to be accepted. Any kind of, you know, violence, um, anger, hostility towards these people who are just trying to enforce the policies. It's like people have lost their minds, you know, and I know people are pushed to the limit yeah. and it's, and in some ways it is bringing out the absolute worst in us because you know, people are coming undone from the stress, you know, right. especially if they're losing jobs and they may lose their home and everyone understands that. And then what I find fascinating is that there's also a group of people who have gone out of their way to be extremely nice. Yes. Like, you know, when I'm walking the dog and I have my mask on and people are passing me and all you can see are like the little tips of their eyes, they're waving yes. and saying hello more so than they ever did, right. you know, before they'd be, they'd have their you know, their headphones in and they just wouldn't even look at you. But now people are going out of their way. Many are yeah. to, to, to have this sense of kindness and politeness. So I hope that more people choose to spread that kindness and love and compassion and not obviously spread the germs. Right. Um, and it's not all that hard to do right. to kill someone because they're trying to enforce uh, either the law or the protocol of the store. Ay, ay, ay. Well, sadly, we're ending on that note, but 
This weekend is going to be Mother's Day, so I wanted to wish you a happy Mother's Day, Lonnie. I hope you have oh, a fabulous, wonderful, loving thank time. You. And happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Yeah, absolutely. I know it's going to be hard. Many of us will not be able to be with our children, um, and it will be yet another holiday and celebration, which will be mostly virtual and sad, but many, many blessings that we, we have children, we're healthy, and that we come from mothers who have been loving. So I want to wish everybody uh, a wonderful Mother's Day. And I want to thank you, Lonnie, for coming on the show. I always love your insight. Where can people get in touch with you or follow you? Uh, I'm on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. And um, I've got, I've got different uh, projects on oxygen. So they can go to oxygen.com and check those out. Ah, great. Terrific. And of course, you can always find me at Anna G News on all my platforms. And I love to read all your comments on YouTube. Many of you know that I do read them and respond sometimes even to the nasty ones. <laughs> I'm asking you to be kind. <laughs> Uh, as always, you can find our content on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and of course, here on YouTube. You can get updates by subscribing to our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. So until next week, this is True Crime Daily, the podcast reminding everyone, don't do crime. <laughs>